this is very informal. So please, yes, if you want to head over and get pizza, you won't offend me or Gary or Shelly if you're moving around. Um, this is kind of unusual for me to um, be sharing presentation time. Because normally it's like, you have an hour, and it's like, okay, we start at 7, and you need to be done by 8. So it's really nice that this is informal. It kind of is like, uh, what, Africa. Um, if you haven't met Shelly, if you'll just stand. Shelly is the chair of our stateside committee. And, and I'm just excited that Shelly and Gary could join us tonight because it just gives a uh, much broader perspective on the work that we do over in Africa. And Gary Evans is the current clinic administrator uh, for the Lutheran Mobile Clinic out of Malawi, Africa. And what time did your flight arrive in Chicago this afternoon? About two. So he really made extra, extra effort and thanks to his uh, children for seeing that he got here safely <laughs> because as you can tell um, Gary is from England and after being in Malawi I don't know how easy it is for you just to switch driving modes because in Malawi oh okay um, can be a bit of a challenge sometimes just coming back and having to handle Chicago and Milwaukee traffic right off what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Central Africa Medical Mission because not some of you do know what I'm talking about, but there's probably some others that are like, what and where? Because that was my, my questions when our oldest daughter, Alicia, said she wanted to go and serve in Africa rather than out of the Twin Cities where she had gotten her public health degree. So I'll give you a little bit about... Um, the background, the history, and then I've got um, a PowerPoint that's just going to do an auto transition for about 25 minutes. After that, I'm going to open it up for questions that Gary can come up and um, give you some of his life experiences from over there. And we have two young ladies that were with uh, Wisconsin Lutheran College group that went to Zambia and one actually had a chance to go to Malawi. So like I say, for her, some of these things will be like deja vu. Um, first of all, how many of you are familiar with the medical clinic? Yeah, yeah that's okay. There's some, okay, um, we actually started in the late 1950s. It's when our missionaries went over to what is now Zambia and wanted to do their gospel outreach that they quickly realized that one person was dealing with both the spiritual and the physical needs of the people. And that person was the witch doctor. Now, they were very prepared to do the gospel outreach, but to handle all the physical needs of the people, they were gonna need some help. So what they did is they came back stateside, they talked to the general convention and said, uh, we're going to need help. And the Central Africa Medical Mission was then organized. So we actually work under the direction and guidance of the Board for World Missions um, through WELLS, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Senate. So that's why uh, we're not a separate organization. We get all of our direction through there. The witchcraft is still a problem today. It's, it's something, um, up here I do have some weavings, carvings, but I also have uh, a little trinket. And there's, actually what we can do is we can pass this around. Whoever ends up with it at the end, um, just get it back to me. But this is what you might find tied around an infant. And it's something that our clinics do deal with on a regular basis. Even though the individuals claim to be Christian, um, that witchcraft is always uh, finding its way uh, into, the, into the everyday lives. Oh, let's see what's here. I 
technology is the one thing that I just have to work with here. There we go. In the early 19, well, it's actually 1961, is when our first clinic was opened in, um, in Zambia. And that's what you're going to see. The first slides are the stationary clinic that uh, was built at that time. It was called a dispensary because that's what it did. It dispensed medications and got to, uh, to treat the people. Right now, our staff is under the direction of Jackson Kalekwa. He is a chief clinical officer. He's got a staff, uh, an RN, lab tech, many different positions. And because both Malawi and Zambia had a mandate a few years ago that all the clinics have to be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, our Zambian clinic has really experienced an increase with patients. Our new clinic building is what you see behind, uh, and they're just now starting to um, make use of that facility. But with the increased number of people, we have increased our staff. They would see, or they do see, just similar to what you would find at your clinics here, respiratory, um, broken bones, types of skin infections. One thing they do treat there that is not here is HIV. They not only counsel, they test, but they also do the treatments uh, for the HIV. Uh, and as some of you may be aware that if you have HIV and you start with the treatments, if, if you continue the treatments, the symptoms go away, but the disease does not. So it's really important that the um, patients continue to come back for those treatments. And Jackson and his staff are very diligent that if they do not come back, to go and find out why they're not. It could be that they've reverted back to the witchcraft instead of the, the medication. This is the uh, waiting room, the reception area of our clinic. People will walk from many different villages to come and be treated. In the outside area of the building, there are a grove of trees, some cement blocks where people will also wait. Our clinics in Zambia and Malawi um, are very special in that it's Christ-centered health care supporting gospel ministry. All of our clinics begin with a devotion, and in Zambia, the church is on the same property. So the pastor can walk right up to the clinic, um, can counsel people, talk to people, network with them, while they're waiting either before clinic or after. The pictures that you're seeing are the actual inside of the clinic. Uh, the building itself could probably fit inside of this room. Very small, very efficient though, because you come in one door and you go down um, past the offices, maybe make a bend at the end, and the other side will happen to be um, where they'll be weighed, maybe get uh, pharmacy items, blood work, something like that, and they'll go out the, the same door. They do make very good use of the room that they have. I had mentioned that we have to be open 24-7. That also means that moms that are giving birth also come to the clinic. And that is one of the reasons we needed that additional building. This is how they take the height for the, the child. It isn't really too much different than what you would have here. We just have nice scales rather than a piece of wood. In Zambia and Malawi, um, the people are very soft-spoken. If I spoke in this tone over there, it would be very offensive. So you get used to using your inner, your whisper voice. But when we go to visit, uh, you have to listen very, very closely to what they're saying. This 
is how they weigh children. Uh, they just put the infant or the toddler in there and um, the scale will measure. And when I was over there visiting, there, um, the, the nurse that was there could probably tell the look on my face as she was putting it, uh, a small child in there. And she's like, don't worry, sister, I've never dropped anyone. So I was like, but it's all in the eye of the beholder. Um, very often we think, what can we do to make their life better? You know, things, maybe you notice the pillow that was in that one photo, very dirty. And as Westerners, as Americans, we'd like to say, oh, let's give them new pillows. But we don't want to ever create a problem by trying to improve something. And what would happen is if we put a new pillow in that place, what's going to happen to that other one? Because it still works. You still can put your head on there. It might be a little dirty, but there's going to probably be an argument over who has the right to take that pillow. So we always have to be very cautious in how we're approaching um, what we're doing, how we're going to make life better, but um, not create other issues along the way. Something else in Zambia that we're experiencing right now that you can ask Gary about in a little while is the fact that many things are verbal. If you make an agreement and you have a handshake, that is an agreement. But in 20 years, if there's not something in writing, there's nothing to prove what was said. Very often it's between the chief of one village and the chief of another and whoever happens to be there at the time. Um, signatures could be a thumbprint. So um, what we need is the computers are helping very much that we're having more things documented. But hard copies are actually hard to come by um, in both countries. What you see here is a borehole. It's the for water. All of our clinics in Zambia and Malawi have boreholes. They don't always work, uh, depending on the water level or if they need repairs. Uh, this is a picture of the school. We actually do have a school uh, right alongside of our property. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Haneke family. Uh, children there take all the same classes that uh, elementary schools do here. The only difference is sometimes they can have eight classes, eight grades in one room. And as you can tell, they do have some books. Um, they can get some basic English, but, um, and our staff does speak English. They can converse in English. Uh, it's just rather broken. So again, we do have to listen very carefully. And this is what it would typically look like when they're waiting for a clinic to begin. I always chuckle that when we go to our clinics, it'll have this little sign that says, um, if you've been waiting longer than 15 minutes, please let us know. Where there, they will have walked for hours and yet they wait very patiently um, to be seen. This is a picture with Niagara Falls. And when I do the presentations, I always like to include some like this because we often think of Africa as dark and dreary and the sand. And Zambia and Malawi are very beautiful. Um, it depends on the time of the year, but when it is the rainy season, things are actually very green and very lush. After this, we will be actually going to the, the um, slides on Malawi. Now, Zambia was the stationary clinic, and Malawi is the Lutheran mobile clinic. And the word mobile means just that. We take all of the medical services out to the people in four different villages. I'll let the slides catch up just a little bit. 
there's just one or two more. All the buildings are brick because of termites. It's amazing, the termite mounds that will be like this. Yes. So if we want them to last, everything has to, to be in bricks. Um, we take a Toyota uh, Land Cruiser out to the four different villages. And every morning, the staff, the medications, anything that they want to take out to that village on that day must be packed. And what you had just seen was a picture of our pharmacy. Um, that's actually on the residence where Gary and his wife Beth live. Uh, Beth is our nurse in charge. She hand, uh, really oversees our entire Malawi staff. Uh, this is a picture kind of what the roads look like right now. There's a wet and a dry season and the wet makes it very difficult. Um, and again, that's something you can ask Gary in a little bit, is the effect of the very heavy rains that are having uh, for Malawi, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. Um, here also, um, each, the Monday, well, it'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the, um, the ambulance and staff go out to a different village. So they range anywhere from half an hour to an hour from Lee Long Way, where um, Gary and Beth live, and that's where the ambulance and all the supplies are kept. So they will travel out to that clinic, and the people, again, walk to there. They wait patiently to be seen. January, it was just shy of 5,000 people that were seen. Now, you have to figure that when our ambulance gets there, it's about nine in the morning, and they leave by about three. So if you start and do the math, there's no HEPA. There's not such a thing as privacy. When they're seen, basically what we have there is they're registering for to be seen. They're gonna bring a book. And in the book, they will write what they're be seen for. And if I was the physician's assist, uh, the clinical officer seeing them, the person would be in front. I would ask them the questions, write what I think in here for a diagnosis. I hand this back. They will get up and go right behind to the pharmacy table that will be behind them. But the physician or the clinical officer does not move. The next person just slides in front of them. Kind of reminds you of like Disney's worlds, their line, how you just see them constantly moving. Well, that's what it would be is the person stands here and all the patients keep moving until everyone is seen. They do have four different lines or five, I think. Um, so if anyone's there with a baby that needs a under five well baby check, they're gonna be in one line. If it's an expectant mom, they're gonna be in another line. So it's very specialized and then there'll be the sick line. And I had mentioned the, the long lines for January. Well, if that sick line is extremely long, as another line gets shorter, they all pitch in so that hopefully that sick line uh, can be seen a little faster. But that's what the pharmacy would look like. And it's really nothing extravagant. It's, they're coming to our clinics to get Tylenol. And just think, all of you, we, we go down to Walgreens and it's like, do we want to leave? Do we want Advil? We probably have five different types we can get. Do we want 24, 100? Or do we want to get the economy and get, you know, two packs in one. And there, they actually need to come to our clinics to try and get just enough to get through for a couple days. Um, something else is that they don't have electricity out in these villages. Just think of what your life would have been like today. From the time you got up to right now, no electricity. Um, they do have solar power, however, and that's rather interesting because if you're traveling out in the rural villages, you'll see a group of three or four 
huts or homes together, and in between them, they will have three solar panels so that they can power up cell phones, their devices, but they don't have running water, they don't have any electrical, but they've kind of bypassed some of that. Um, the medications will be dispensed in bags like this, as well as some of the small little pill bottles. If they can't read, there'll be check marks uh, underneath the sun or the moon so that they know how many to dispense or to be taking at any given time. What you're seeing here are the, the clinics themselves. Again, they're small, so people gather outside. They go inside for the medical services, and then they, um, a lot of them leave right after. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. The, what you're seeing there happens to be um, the church at Malalamwe, and the clinic building became too small for the services, and I had mentioned that um, we do the devotions. Well, in Malawi, they also do church services there on Sunday. That's one of the reasons why in Zambia we could abide by the 24-hour, 24-7, mandate. In Malawi, we couldn't because our buildings are also the churches and our staff goes from clinic to clinic. So they're not available to be at one site for 24-7. Unfortunately, the effect of that was that in Zambia, we still get financial assistance. In Malawi, all of that was stopped, or at least to help with much of the payroll and it had a $100,000 impact on us in one year. Um, but the Lord has been very good to us, and our services have not slowed down or been hindered. Um, we've had very good uh, response from donors and supporters, and our, um, our mission still continues. What you see here, you know, after the devotion, one of our nurses will also give a health lesson, and that's what she is doing, um, talking to all of those that are still gathered outside of the clinic doors. In Malawi, we do provide um, what's called super cereal. It comes through the World Food Program, and it is a supplement that we can give to those that have... Um, orphans or um, families that really need that extra nutrition or supplements. From what um, Gary's wife Beth had emailed me, she, she was saying that these heavy rains, one of the things they're really worried about is all the standing water is going to have a big mosquito population. And as you're aware, malaria is carried through those mosquitoes and what is going to be the ramifications in a few months. Um, so, again, that's something to keep in your prayers, is that the people in the southern part of Africa are spared the spike in malaria. I had, you had seen one of the water pumps before, and I had mentioned that each of the, the clinics have have one, they're just a little different style. But this is where, if you think back with the Bible, people gathered at the well to find out what was going on. This was like their social point, and that's very much what happens in Malawi and Zambia, is that people gather at that well to find out what's been happening and um, kind of to catch up. So. Um, Pastors, anyone can, can go there, and it's just a great place to, to talk with people. The children are the same in the States, in Malawi, in Zambia. They all have 
great smiles and are the most welcoming to strangers and visitors. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like they're the ones that take the, the hard hit when we have the starvation and a lot of the diseases that go through. All right, um, this only has a couple more slides to, to go through. It's what you would typically see uh, if you were just traveling on the roads in Africa with the women carrying things on their head and the children. Um, women and children work very hard in Africa. Without having the electricity, it's their responsibility to gather wood, to make fires, to um, prepare the meals. That's very much in the villages in the rural. If you get to Lusaka and Lilongwe, which is the capital of Malawi, it would remind you very much of the, um, the villages that we would see in rural Wisconsin, where maybe not the storefront so much, but uh, a lot of people, millions of people living in one area, a lot of roundabouts, a lot of traffic in the city that's kind of can get grid very quickly because um, they're not, they weren't um, built thinking that far ahead maybe of what traffic could be like. But again, um, and I'd strongly encourage all of you, if you have that opportunity, to travel abroad, it sounds like many of you have. Um, yeah, take advantage of that because um, just the cultural differences is quite an experience for you. So with that, I'm gonna have Gary come up and we, we've got as long, I guess, as we want that you can can ask Gary some questions because <laughs> well, your kids maybe. <laughs> yeah, especially those that rock. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, why don't you explain a little bit about the rains right now and well, the effect, was, right. just the water, the electricity. Well, we've had a lot of people uh, contact us and say, oh, you know, how are you suffering through Hurricane I Day? Well, the truth be told, as far as the um, Lutra Mobile Clinic in Malawi is concerned, it missed us. It actually went to the south. But about two weeks before that, a storm developed that actually dumped rain on Malawi and southern Malawi especially that really caused most of the damage that happened in Malawi. That storm then went <coughs> east, went out back into the Indian Ocean, gathered strength from the warm waters there, and came back as Hurricane I Day, but further... Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. That way they can pick it up when they're... Just bear with me a minute here. And uh, came back as Hurricane I Day, but really caused most of the damage in Baira, and then it kind of went on a straight line course to Harare. Um, in Malawi, it didn't really, it, it kind of exacerbated a problem, but it didn't cause a problem. The problem was already there. In fact, the good news for Malawi was that the aid agencies were already in place in southern Malawi. In fact, our, one of the guards at our house is from Nsanji, which is in southern Malawi. And he actually asked for his savings because his family's crops have been wiped out. And actually, that's probably the biggest story that nobody hears about. Yes, houses are lost, and there's disease because all of a sudden, the chimbudzis, which are there, the pit latrines get filled up. So there's nowhere you know, to go to the bathroom. That's a problem. It's a health problem. But the fact is, if your crops get wiped out, now you've got a food problem. Not now, but maybe in a year's time. So that's one of the things I think a lot of people are concerned about is, okay, what's, you know, what are the long-term ramifications of this? But as far as uh, we were concerned, we were without power for about three days. Uh, we have a generator, thanks to the generosity of CAM. Um, but the Malawi relies a lot on hydroelectric power, and because of the heavy rains, what happens is a lot of debris comes down the river, blocked up the intakes to the hydroelectric plant, and, uh, and so, we were without power until they had that cleared out, but really, for, for us, frankly, no big deal. Um, I do have video on my phone. Beth had some real adventures getting out to clinic. 
uh, like you saw the the truck get stuck we, she got she got stuck twice and we have these land cruisers and they they are seriously off-road vehicles i mean they can carry 13 people plus another 500 pounds of equipment up on the roof um, high ground clearance brand new tires and if you get off the center line of the road because what happens is the road starts like this and then as the graders come through it gradually gets more and more of a crown so when it gets wet if you're riding along the center it's fine if you get off to the side your vehicle will literally slide off that's what happened and then you got to dig out you put branches in under the tires or you use other things carpet is another good one and that get that'll that'll get you back on the road again um, there's always actually the other thing that happens is always a ton of people that will show up and help dig you out and then you give them a few quats just say thank you very much and be on your way being without electricity I had brought that up what's a typical length of time that you're out of electricity well they had rolling power cuts and but there's an election coming up and so to be nice so they actually started buying power from Zambia so actually for a while we weren't getting any power cuts at all Zambia but, but, had them. but Zambia had them because we were taking <laughs> we were buying their electricity um, but we had uh, for a while we were pretty much without power for probably five six hours a day on average but they had a but they had a schedule that they published online so if you know when the power cuts are coming you can kind of plan your day around it so it really wasn't it's not not that bad when you kind of know it's coming does anyone have a, a question what are the most prevalent like diagnoses over there like over here you know we obviously have issues well, with well, that part of it, right now, today, th this time of year, the most prevalent diagnosis is malaria. We are now, the, w the rainy season brings malaria. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there was one day where we had over 200 outpatients, and I think they did over 150, 160 malaria tests. So right now, that's the big issue. The, the malaria tests are such a blessing because it wasn't that long ago that everyone that came was just treated for malaria. And it was using up so much of the antibiotics and the medication because it's like, well, we're not sure, just treat them. Now there's just a finger prick and they're tested outside of the clinic so they don't even have to go in the line. And within what, five minutes, 10 minutes, yeah. they know if it's positive or not. So then, um, the person yeah. that took the test can write in there, and if they're positive, then they're going in to get the medication. But if it's negative, then they're told, well, you know, you can come to one of our other clinic if it's not better at the end of the week or come back next week. Right. But it's making sure that the medication is going out to the right people. Right. USAID and DFID, that's the English uh, development agency, provide a lot of our malaria meds, mosquito nets, and testing kits. Um, one of the, you know, we're, we're also kind of uh, a victim of our own success in some ways, because you know we always have the meds. That's one of the things that we have. The the nurses before Beth and Beth herself. I mean, they are absolutely, you know, focused on always making sure we got good supplies of the meds we need. Because you can go to the local district, you can go to the local health. There are health government health clinics not that far from us. And people will go there and they'll get tested for malaria. Yes, yes, you have malaria, but we don't have any medications for you. And so we're very fortunate that we have them. But the problem then happens is that people will then wait a week for us to come because we only go to these villages once a week. Then the problem becomes they're way sicker by the time we get there. So that's when the ambulance becomes into its own because you know, what we, we, we triage patients when we get there in the morning. And, it's, you know, even they let me spot, you know, I go out every, every now and again, and I, I can spot somebody with malaria because pretty much they'll be lying down with a blanket over them sleeping. Nine times out of ten, they're going to have malaria. And if they're that bad, and they may have walked a couple of kilometers, like Linda said, to get there, I mean, it's not unusual. You've got to treat them right away. Then what happens is, you know, if they're... If they're was it their white count drops, right? 
I've seen, you know, this is where the privacy issue comes in because some poor person will be in the middle of the clinic with a couple of IVs in them and the whole village watching what's going on. So, or, or we then literally have to go lights and sirens and get them into the hospital in the long way, which is about an hour's drive there and back. And Beth's been in the back of that, of that ambulance, a couple of harrowing rides where you're literally driving down the middle of the road with all the, you know, everything going and then hoping that everyone else get, gets out of your way as you come through. So. And when he said goes to the hospital, an RN at a hospital in Malawi or Zambia does not have the same duties or responsibilities as here in the stateside. Much of the duties that an RN would do here falls on a family member. So the person that they would be taking has to also have a family member that will go with <coughs> to yeah. provide food, do the dressings, um, most. And, and kids, they'll have three or four kids on a bed, sideways on the bed. Mm -hmm. But the other, I guess the other thing is to, to fully answer your question, um, what's changed? But my, my wife was actually with the RN, she did the same job 30 years ago. And back then you see a lot of malnutrition. You do see it, and that's why we have the nutrition program. But what's changed is now high blood pressure and diabetes because the diet's changed, more sugar in the diet. And, uh, and in fact, I know in, in, in uh, Wambeji in Zambia, they actually run blood, uh, blood pressure clinics every Saturday, I think, or every other mm -hmm. Saturday. Hypertension. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. We, in Zambia, they're free. Okay. Um, Zambia, the, the, the Wambe, what Linda didn't tell you is I'm kind of involved in both clinics right now, um, helping well, out in, in Zambia for a little bit. Why don't I just do a quick what's happening in Zambia. Um, until um, January, missionary Dan Sargent, we had a missionary that really oversaw most of the operations at the Mombeji Clinic. And Pastor Sargent took a call to Peshtigo, which I think most of you know where that is. Um, when he took the call, we had to make a very hard decision. Um, first of all, who would now oversee the operations? Because Pastor Sargent was that person that our staff really relied on. If they had any questions, they would be on their cell phone all the time asking past, uh, missionary sergeant what they should do and he kind of was the, he just he was the liaison and did a lot of the work behind the scenes of the clinic so when he took this call we made a decision to actually hire a young man Ali Saad Banda who's got a public health degree or I think he's got it now correct close Close, okay, um, to become our clinic administrator. So we're going to have a similar setup to the Malawi clinic where the, there will be someone in charge and a clinic administrator. But Ali Saad does not have, he's very familiar with the clinic staff, with the operations. He's very familiar with all the villages around and is highly respected. He's got a great networking already in place but he needs a lot of training for the administrative side. And Gary has been awesome as far as going from Malawi <coughs> to Zambia to help mentor him. Uh, and again, this is all within the last month or so that's really uh, shaping up. But our Zambian clinic does not have uh, anyone from stateside or other than uh, Zambian national nationality, overseeing them. So, I'm sorry. What was your question again? Uh, just the, like services and medications, like how do they pay for it? Or do they so, it? Zamb right. The clinic in Zambia is very is is different. It's a static clinic, but it's also kind of tied into the government system. And I think in in Zambia, your basic health care is free but I think they do pay for medications. So 
in Malawi, we actually charge 500 kwacha per visit for an outpatient. Um, that is the equivalent of about 70 cents. But you get all your medications as well. So we do get those for free. Uh, one of the problems actually we did have was with uh, epilepsy meds. Kind of going back to what Linda said, because what we were finding out from our staff was carbamazepine and drugs like that. People were taking them who maybe, what would happen is a bunch of people would come in from a village with these health passports and say, okay, I'm picking up the epilepsy meds for four people for a month. And what they would do is they take those meds and they give them or sell them to the local witch doctors who'd make up some brew with our medication saying, hey, look what I can cure. And, uh, and so the people weren't always getting the meds. We weren't charging for these refills. So what we've actually done is now we keep a record of who shows up. We want to see the whites of their eyes like once a month and we, we charge. And all of a sudden now we think that abuse has really dropped off. You have to realize that an average Malawian in the area that we um, handle, 300 kwacha maybe a year. 500, well, it's 500, it's 720 kwacha to the dollar now. Mm -hmm. But 700 kwacha would be about a day's wage. So you're, you know, it's so. a pretty good chunk of, of your money that people are willing to spend. But on the other hand, we, we do charge not because we necessarily, it helps our budget, yes, but it also means that people who genuinely need treatment come. Accountability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Besides the carbamazepine, have there been other conflicts with which doctors? Uh, we've, I heard one of our staff visited a witch doctor this before we got there and got into trouble for it. But, um, it is very much alive and well. Um, certainly, actually, in the area between Blantyre, did you go to Malangi when you were there? No. In uh, Malangi, Blantyre is in the southern region, and actually Lutheran Central in Malawi isn't in the central region where we are. It's actually in the south, and it's mainly between Blantyre and Malangi. And you know, 30,000 Lutheran uh, wells or LCCA-affiliated you know, churches there and there was a, a lot of issues with what they call vampires and people literally stealing body or killing people for their body parts and it was going on a lot in that area so you know you're never you're never far away from the whole witch doctor thing and if you go to a market which would remind you kind of like our flea markets that we have here you're always going to see squares blocked off where they're selling witchcraft items so you'll see a pile of shoes, some, some shirts, and then witchcraft. So yeah. It's just, it is part of their everyday life that um, would like to think 60 years has made a, a difference. And it has to some degree. But when you're dealing with different cultures, it's something you do have to understand that um, it's something you're always dealing with. We have similar things here in the States right now that we really don't want to maybe always address, but it does come up, so. Mm -hmm. um, are a lot of the doctors and nurses from like Europe and America, or are a lot of local people who work in this place? We only have one. Uh, there are I guess if you include Beth in Malawi, there are 11 medical staff in, uh, Malawi. in Malawi. In there are one, two, three, four, I think four in Zambia, and they are, and apart from my wife, they are all uh, Malawians or Zambians. We don't actually have doctors. Okay. Uh, we do have uh, clinical officers and uh, we call medical assistants, and they do most of our outpatient diagnosis work. The nurses and midwives tend to do the under fives, antenatals, and uh, family planning clinics, but we don't. Um, one of the things that we discovered, because we had a vacancy, and we wanted to actually replace uh, a nurse who had uh, taken another job. 
and we, I went along to the medical council because we needed to answer the question, can a nurse, die, can a nurse prescribe? And the answer is no in Malawi, a little bit different in Zambia, which forces to hire what we call a clinical officer. And these guys only have a three-year diploma, but they actually can do surgery, little minor little surgeries. Uh, Jackson Kalekwa is only a, he is a clinical officer. That is his qualification. But they do do minor surgeries and you know probably C-sections and stuff like that out at Wambeji. So the answer is where it's about as indigenized as we can, and most of it, frankly, is these are very practically trained nurses, most of them. And most of the business is going on in Chichewa or Nyanja or Tonga, whatever the local language is. And much as you know, we try to learn it, and I can probably ask for a cold beer and stuff like that, you know, uh, I can't get much beyond that. So to have an in-depth conversation with somebody about exactly what's wrong with them, really, you need, you need Chichewa speakers to do that. And, and they're very competent uh, staff. My wife, what she does, if you look at the line, we have an outpatient, we have undervised, and we have, then we have pharmacy right here. So Beth parks herself right in some front of the pharmacy. And then as people come through in the pharmacy line, she gets their, she gets their, uh, their health passport and checks diagnosis versus prescription just to make sure you know, she's running quality control. And sometimes she'll see something she doesn't like, get a stethoscope on, and then maybe take the person back for another look. But that's really the depth of her involvement medically. Which is a long, that is the improvement. 60 years ago, we had American nurses over there mm -hmm. um, doing it, all of these services. And to see that progression is amazing because it, as in Zambia, we don't have the American presence there right now, and yet the clinic is doing well. Um, mm -hmm. And we're hoping that someday in Malawi, that will also be the case. It's probably gonna be a, quite a few years down the road, but that would be a goal. And the medical mission itself, we don't know where the, what the Lord has in mind for us. If we'll be exploring other countries where missionaries and there's also a need, um, we're always open to ideas and suggestions um, that hopefully that will come from board from world missions or another need that's brought to our attention. But if you're considering CAM, one of the things you have to think about is um, the first few months you are there, you have to actually get your Malawian nursing license. They won't simply accept your RN from the States. So you're expected to spend, I th think it was 40, was it 120 hours? It was some, you've got to basically spend, it's, it's, uh, yeah, 40 to 100, 100 hours. I can't remember exactly what it is. At Kamuza Central Hospital in Lilongwe getting uh, basically oriented. And Beth said that's the worst time she's, it's, that's, that's tough duty, actually. She lost, she, had, she lost several patients while she was there. They it's just a, don't have the medications and resources yep. that are needed. And it's tough to watch something like that when you know the simple basics that we have here yeah. and they can't get them there. Mm -hmm. yes. This is more of a question for general health care in Malawi or Zambia. But um, in the States and other like European countries, you're seeing more of a um, increase in like mental health resources do you see any types of mental health resources in um, India, or is it a focus on the physical medical diagnoses it's not something that we have directly become involved with i remember seeing a patient come through once who had extremely high blood pressure and you know so they gave her whatever as you get uh, really you have to understand that i do go to clinic every now and again if i behave they let me count pills that's <laughs> That's the extent of my medical. I'm a civil engineer, actually, is what I, what I did for a living. And uh, anyway, I remember this one, this one patient came through. I'm sorry, should I stand on the mark? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
But we had this one patient come through and she had, you know, she was slim, not heavy, you know, young. And, but her blood pressure was like, I don't know, it was up in the 200s. It was way up there. So they gave her whatever it is that, you know, immediately brings it down. But they couldn't understand why it should be so high. And then they started talking to her and finding out that her son had left her and had to have a big fight. And basically, she'd stressed out. So, you know, we don't really, like I say, you do see the results of maybe mental anguish and stress in high blood pressure and stuff like that. But we certainly are not equipped to really deal with mental pain. If we did have somebody who had that kind of issue going on, we'd probably refer them because we, we really aren't equipped to deal with it. Although Mrs. Hoa, I think, does, one of our nurses does actually have a background in, uh, in mental illness. And actually, we gave, she gave a talk now, I think about it, at a youth conference on how you know, issues that come up, depression and so on and so forth. But I don't think we could necessarily, we don't, certainly don't have the meds for it. Um, just in between, I think there's, if some of you do need to leave, please don't feel obligated that you have to, to stay. Um, just giving you that freedom, because it's like, okay, you know, I see some kind of looking at your, your watches. Um, we will definitely stay here and visit with as many of you as you would like. We won't be leaving right away, but if you do need to, to leave, uh, feel free at this time to, to do that, or at any time. So. Okay, that's all right. You can leave. And I think but, a couple other, yeah. But I, I guess I, you know, I, I'll make a, just a couple of comments that uh, our total budget is what, 300000 mm -hmm. 250 300 and we provide, you know, health care in rural areas to, we saw 47,000 people in Malawi last year. And we saw, I think, around 10 to 15,000 at Wambeji. So what, 60 odd thousand people? It's an extremely efficient operation. Very efficient. Very low overhead, really, when you think of the number of people we reach. Well, we figure out 98 almost 99% of all of our donations go right to the clinic. We're all volunteers, volunteers plus, <laughs> so. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Here we go. So do you go to a different village, like a different clinic in a different village or mom does and everything? Every, every day are there certain days for each one? Well, if it's Tuesday, it's some Sambo. Wednesday, Susie's. Thursday, Mwala and every other Friday, Tunga. And so these are all villages that are within an hour's drive of, of where, we, where the house is. And it used to, years ago, it was one other. to Tonga like the third Friday, and they had to do alternating because people there don't have calendars, watches, and it got to be too confusing. But they can plan things as every other Friday. Right. And so that continuity <coughs> in their life is very important. Yeah, Tunga is actually a smaller village. They don't really need, in fact, you, know, you can just tell by the outpatient the counts, it, it's the poorest. But Beth will tell you that they have their act together when it comes to antenatals and under fives. That is probably one of our busier clinics. But they're high up, there's no water there, and so you actually don't get a lot of malaria. So we don't tend to see spikes this time of year of more and more patients coming like we do at the other clinics. No water? <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of the pros and cons. Yes, Abby. What do you think some of the greatest needs there, like as far as medications or equipment that they have in the U.S. that aren't in Malawi still here? Hmm. That's a good question. I think we're pretty well for what the, the stuff that we that we deal with. That uh, certainly, in, I know more about Malawi than I. I'm sorry. I know I know more about. I know. Hang on. Just okay. Right here. I know more about uh, Malawi than I do Zambia, and I don't really think as far as 
medications are concerned, we really, you know, we really lack for much. Uh, you'd be surprised what you can go and buy at very reasonable prices at the pharmacies there. Um, I can't ever, I can't ever remember Beth ever saying, oh, I wish we had such and such. It's very, you know, it's a very much a kiss, you know, keep it simple. Uh, you know, it's very much based on primary health care, preventative health care. You know, first aid. Right. Yeah, I mean, but even that, I mean, even then, the, the focus really is mothers and children. That's really, really, really the focus of the clinic, is healthy babies, healthy mothers, and then, but then we'll also deal with the outpatient stuff as well. But I think really that the focus has always tended to be mothers and children in Malawi. It's a bit that way in Zambia too. Um, we had friends there who did deliveries like every night. They, they deliver a lot of babies there. Um, I know in Zambia they want a centrifuge. We're, we're looking into one of those because they do have a full lab there. In Malawi, we just, there's just no way we could pack a centrifuge on the, in the land cruiser every day and you just couldn't leave one on site because um, stolen. we actually had, we, right we had a mattress stolen in fact you know we're gonna and so we and then you say okay how do you deal with that you're gonna get a guard well why would you get pay a guard 50,000 quatra a month to guard a 30,000 quatra mattress right mm -hmm. so you go talk to the chief and say hey you want our services you got to help us out here go talk to your people and tell them please don't steal our mattresses um, in Malawi, one of the things we've actually kind of got involved with was with a Korean organization who were doing ultrasounds. And that was something that they were actually going to maybe train, give some rudimentary training in looking at fetal ultrasounds. Um, but it's the reading of them. That's the problem. You can take the ultrasound. I mean, literally, they have, they have an iPad. And, and, this, and a Bluetooth connection, you know, probe or whatever you call it. But it's not the problem. The problem isn't actually taking the ultrasound. It's like it's interpreting it. But then they said, well, you we can actually send those over to us in Houston, send the pictures to us in Houston, and we can analyze and send them back to you. So that might be a direction that perhaps, you know, we've kind of been making inquiries or we've had been approached by a couple of organizations to actually deal with that kind of thing. So. That could be a direct, that could be something that, you know, could help help out. But we also felt that most of our nurse wives are pretty experienced. You know, the the ultrasound probably isn't going to catch much that they don't. Okay.